Remember the hereafter And you will remember why you are here Remember the hereafter And you will remember why you are here And what you are after الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الصلاة والسلام عليك يا رسول الله وعلى آلك وأصحابك يا حبيب الله الصلاة والسلام عليك يا نبي الله الصلاة والسلام عليك يا نبي الله وعلى آلك وأصحابك يا نور الله وعلى آلك وأصحابك يا نور الله صلى الله تعالى على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم Welcome back to Yolo You only live twice Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen There are many benefits of reciting Dhul Dipak upon Nabi Akreem Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam Imagine a day which is filled with terror and difficulties and darknesses and on that day you would have a special light Nabi Akreem Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam is reported to have said Decorate your gatherings with Dhul Dipak upon me as this will be nur for you on the day of judgment Sallu ala al-Habib Sallallahu ala ala Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi We've got a, a very packed uh, program for you today with a lot of very interesting topics But before we delve into the background and I introduce the topics Let me welcome my guests Now we've got a, a very special lineup today because Alhamdulillah we're particularly blessed um, Usually we have uh, two uh, panel members uh, who Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen give us their madni pearls but today we've got three. We've got a new setup for you. So I'm going to start from the right and uh, start with Shiraz Bay. Shiraz Bay, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You well? Alhamdulillah. And uh, next uh, is uh, our beloved Habib Bay. Habib Bay, how are you? Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Journey good? All good, mashallah. Mashallah, mashallah. And um, our very special guest, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, and a uh, very close friend of mine. Uh, Bisharad Bay from Preston. MashaAllah. Bisharad Bay, hope you well. Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. Jazakallah khair for coming. Now, viewers of Madni Channel, uh, we've been on a, a beautiful journey where um, our learned scholars and uh, Bisharad Bay and I try to give us an insight into when the soul was created, how it arrived in the world, what the tests of the world were, how the good soul departed, how the bad soul departed, what happened to the good soul in the grave, what happened to the bad soul in the grave, how the questions were dealt with, and then depending on the deeds, how were they were left in the grave? Were they being punished or did they have a life of bliss in the grave? Now having reached that point in this lifetime continuum, we then moved to a new segment, and that new segment was that Tika, whoever's there is in the grave and he's, depending on his deeds, he is receiving the rewards or being punished. What about the rest of humanity? Where is that heading? And then, alhamdulillah, we had a good few programs in relation to the minor signs of Qiyamah. And then we started to move on to the major signs of Qiyamah. So we learnt about the tyrannies, the problems, the immorality, the breakdown of moral values, killing will be rife, disasters will be there, the earth will be covered with injustice. And then the great Imam Mahdi will appear and bring and unite the Muslims together and then the deceiver will appear and then we talked about Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, the great Prophet of Allah Azza Today's program is slightly different because today we are going to start with somebody who is truly amazing and we wanted to start off with how this particular Hasti, this particular personality um, not only changed um, the uh, face of the beautiful Islam that we inherited in the 19th century and made life easier for us, but also on very intellectual topics, including these topics of what will happen in the days coming up, um, provided a great wealth of guidance. A special scholar, a special scholar who had so much knowledge, who had so much dedication, so much pride, the scholars write that in the last 150 years, the world has not seen a scholar like him. Yeah. 
most people who um, are clever, they are clever in one subject, they are clever in two subjects. Most people who excel in the world and people recognize them for their skills are only skillful in one particular subject, at the maximum two. But this one personality, whether it's fiqh, whether it's Arabic rules, whether it's syntax, whether it's uh, hadith mubarakah, whether it's the rulings of Sharia, whether it's sciences, whether it's mathematics, whether it's algebra, whether it's you know medicine, whichever field, astrology, astronomy, whichever field you looked at, this person seemed to be the master in the last 150 years. Nobody could beat him. Even down to the fact that when you looked at um, poetry in the Shan of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alaihi wa sallam, even today a hundred and something years on, people are still mesmerized by his great, his great book, Hadaik Bakshish. You know, such an amazing book. So those of you who are sharp eared and sharp eyed will know that when I mention Hadaik Bakshish, there's only one person that we can truly be talking about. And these accolades, these special um, kind of titles, are there for Hazrat Allah Hazrat Imam Ahmad Raza Khan alayhi rahmatu rahman. Truly a, a marvel of the last century and truly a great, great uh, Ashiki Rasul, a devotee of Nabiya Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and truly somebody who worked day and night for the betterment of this ummah. When the fitnas um, started in the, uh, in the uh, South Asian subcontinent, people were distributing wrong versions of the Quran and fabricated versions. He alone stood out and he said, the love of Nabi Akreem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is fundamental and any translation that you do must incorporate the love. If you translate the Quran without the love of Nabi Akreem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you will have a book, but you will not have the glorious Quran. We dedicated today's YOLO to Allah Hazrat and generally about Allah Hazrat, we'll have the comments of our Mubalagin and our learned scholars and then we will move on to see what Allah has said about um, the minor signs of Qiyamat and the other signs of the Day of Judgment. So, um, I'm going to start off with uh, Shiraz Bay. Um, Allah has it. Go on, tell us something beautiful about him. Tell the viewers of Madni Channel something magnificent about this amazing personality. Uh, Imam Ahmad Raza Khan, alayhi wa um, we are like you know, dust particles on his feet. Allah, Allah. And you know, for us people to talk about him is a great honor for us. Uh, and even our words are limited in, you know, um, talking about this person's, uh, how, he, how he was. In short words, I mean, if you look at uh, many different scientists, if you look at these big scholars that have come in the past, mathematicians, doctors, if you get all the sciences, that these people mastered, and they were geniuses in their field. And Allah Hazrat is a combination of all of that. Allah. Mm -hmm. So he's not just a genius, he's a genius cubed. I mean, he's got every, he's mastered every subject that was thrown upon him. Up to now, there's not one software that can easily, you know, if you put in the values of Varasat, just briefly, Varasat is when a person passes, inheritance, yeah, when a person passes away, uh, the money that's left over after burying him, after paying off his debts, uh, after acting upon his will, whatever is left, you give that into inheritance. The family members, whoever the inheritors are, they will gain that wealth. And up to now, there's not one software that could completely give you the answer of inheritance. You know, where you could put the value in and put your family members mm. in and give you the right answer. You still have to go and check it with the scholar. So this, this, there's no computer, there's no software. It's very complicated. It is very, very com uh, complicated. And that's why it's classed as half of it, because it's that deep. And Imam Ahmad Raza Khan, a person came to him. Now, whilst he was performing wuzu, and gave him a question of, you know, warathat. And Imam Ahmad Raza Khan, like within instance, you know, like when you press an equal sign <laughs> on the calculator, and it just comes without, without hesitation, without thinking. Al Asr just given this answer. There's no calculator that could do that. There's no software design that could properly do that. And Allah Hazrat, he sat there, he's not even playing, paying a complete attention. He's performing well. He was at the finishing wuzu before he started wuzu. He just getting ready. And he's given him the complete answer. And he said, You get a pen and paper, write this down, and I'll tell you. And Allah Hazrat, I don't know how his brain works, 
But you know, this just astonishes us. Do you know what's what's amazing is sometimes we use the term genius, and you sit back and think, should I really be giving this person this title of genius? Is he really a genius, or is he just very clever? And so you, you're kind of debating there. With Allah Hazrat, it's like. The word genius doesn't really do justice to him mm-hmm. because he's so amazing. I mean, from what you said, I remembered that uh, Azrat uh, Amjad Ali Rahmatullah came to him and he said, Look, you know, there, there is certain fitna going about where, as an empire is leaving, they're distributing the Quran and the, the version of the Quran is concocted. And so we need a Urdu translation of the Quran for South Asia. So Allah has, because of all his commitments to the deen, he had all sorts of projects ongoing. He said, look, I just haven't got the time to really do this. I've got so much other Madni work to do. But what I can say is during the afternoon, I nap for a little bit, have a rest. Because he used to sleep, I think, the scholars write four or five hours maximum. So he said, I had a nap in the afternoon. What I'll do is I'll dedicate that time to this. So send the scholars in. And during that time, we'll go through the Ayah Mubarakas and I will dictate the translation. So the scholars used to come in, they used to sit there and they used to say, this is the Ayah Mubarakah, and Allah used to say, this is the translation. And they used to think, just off the top of his head, and they used to think, okay, that was almost, you know, verbatim off his head. So they used to then go back, go through all the books and tafsirs and everything else, and then they used to say, that's amazing, because having checked everything, the translation should be the translation that Allah Hazrat Imam Ahmad Rahman has just dictated like mm-hmm. that. How can somebody do that? Well, this was the genius. I mean, like I said, the word genius doesn't do justice, but we've not got a better word. You know, even there was a, a time where Allah Hazrat used a word, and they said this word is going to be, because this translation was for the public. The scholars knew the translation. This was for the public. They said this word's going to be too difficult for the public. So these scholars sat down and they spent days just trying to find an alternative for this word. They could not find an alternative. They had to stick with that word. Basically, what Allah Hazrat said from his tongue the first time was the correct one. There was no, you could, there was no need. That, there was, it was impossible to change it. L- let me tell you the beauty of Allah Hazrat's Kanzul Iman. Um, sometimes, I, 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 <coughs> Alhamdulillah, Rabbil I mean, because of the blessings of the Madni environment in Dawat Islam, you all try and read the Quran and I, you try and read the English translation. Sometimes when you read the English translation, you think, I don't think that, I'm not following that. Straight away you think, okay. Get Allah has a Surdu version, and I've got that one with the three columns in it. So you just come across and read the Urdu, and straight away you know exactly what's going on. And once or twice, you know, I've spotted that sometimes the English version may get the context wrong in the sense that they may refer to a comment to a certain person. But when you look across, you think, Subhanallah, look at Allah has a Surdu, and everything's so perfect. I mean, I, I said this the other day as well. I said, you know, so far as the translation of the Quran is concerned, we cannot restrict that because there will come people who will be able to do magnificent because the Quran is such a vast ocean that it's unlimited. But for the this century and at the moment and in the last 100, 150 years, there has not been, and I have not seen, and the scholars testify to this, a better translation of the glorious Quran into Urdu than Allah Hazrat. That's how And Harumba is mentioned Habibu. regarding uh, the translation. It's not, you know, when you see other translators, when they are writing, they'll be sat down in their room, in the office, no disturbance, you know, working each ayat probably takes a, a long time just to derive the meanings and write down what is best suited. But Imam Muhammad Raza Khan is mentioned when he was uh, doing the translation of the Quran, he only was dictating it. He was reading out the, the, the translation. The ayah would be read out and he would read out the translation and it would be wrote down. And it's even mentioned that it was as if the pen was moving itself and the words were writing itself. That's how beautiful the words of Allah was. And the scholars that were, uh, the panel of scholars that Allah had around him, uh, who, were, who were also his khulafa, his successors, they went back and looked at the ayats and tried to match them with the tafasir, the commentaries of the Holy Quran. And they saw that they were a perfect match in terms of a combination of all the tafasir mixed together and presented in one single ayah. Subhanallah. That was a beautiful You beautiful know what happens, Rumba, you know when we actually study tafsir, uh, general study, now what happens is the scholars like Imam Fakhruddin Razi for like one ayat he'll give 18 different you know points about it and well there's so much points in tafsir you actually get stuck okay which one do we pick out and follow here it gets, it gets tricky and then what alhamdulillah what you know the benefit we get from Allah Hazrat is in this sense is that 
we go and look at his translation and his translation pinpoints towards this specific meaning or this specific interpretation of the ayat so it actually gives us like you know if you're studying tafsir you know what it, his translation in simple words encompasses the correct meaning and is this just this alone in his translation is easy for the public it saves the aqidah for the public but even for scholars today when they are struggling okay hmm? which one which interpretation do we follow and when we look at the words Allah Hazrat uses that gives us the you know it just clicks and we like you see that is perfect. something so amazing I mean for the viewers of Madani channel they may think oh these guys are going on about it but especially you guys will understand this I remember I was speaking to Kamar Madani Saab who has been working on the translation of the glorious Quran and he said he said sometimes you get stuck on a word and you've got to find the appropriate translation and you could be there for hours or well, ages, days yeah. at a time and this happens quite regularly so sometimes he goes I can translate five ayah mubarakas within an hour and have the right word and I look at the tafsir and I say the context is right and the spelling and the grammatics and the sentences everything is right and sometimes when I'm translating I could be racking my brains, I'll be ringing people, I'll be contacting Mufti Qasim Sahib saying I cannot and for Allah Hazrat to stand there and to verbatim do it and then these scholars go back and check that just testifies to the amazing status uh, uh, of this personality Sharabai Allah Hazrat without doubt is the best uh, scholar in the last century Subhanallah. without doubt for that. and uh, he wrote more than a thousand books on different disciplines of Islamic sciences as well and not only that Allah Hazrat is accepted yani, all over the world and declared and appreciated as a mujaddid, as a reviver uh, right. by all the ulama yani, this isn't just for the Indian subcontinent but for the entire world as well that's a very good point that because a lot of people they tend to associate Allah Hazrat with Hindu Park and they say you know he was in that area but actually a lot of Allah Hazrat's fatwas were, had the endorsement of hundreds of ulama from all around the world including Makkah, Park and Medina and Munawwara and you know Baghdad and everywhere else so there were some fatwas 300 to 400 scholars testing I was going to mention about the fatwa Rizviya now, Alhamdulillah, this is such a, a combination of question and answers that even today the scholars that are reading this, like I was doing some research on it, that a common Muslim who reads uh, you know, this encyclopedia can Alhamdulillah become a scholar from reading it. And the scholars that actually uh, read this, Alhamdulillah from scholars they become mufti Subhanallah, it's, it's such an amazing book I remember uh, our Nigran Sahib Khalid Bhai said you know yeah, I wish there's what somebody to translate for Tawar Rizvi even Bahari Shariat as well Bahari Shariat I think is being translated at the moment but these books and again Bahari Shariat Allah is uh, Mufti Amjad Ali Azmi Rahmatullah isn't it but and that was that he was one of the Khalifas Success, and yeah. one of the students of Allah Hazrat so you know his students and he produced such great scholars that they, in their own right, went on to become leaders and muftis and really authorities on certain subject matters. Definitely. I mean, this is an amazing. Yeah. Remember, you know, he said uh, translating for Tawar Zabiya. Tell you something amazing that Amir al Sunnat has done. Uh, what he has done, and Amir al Sunnat again, he's wrote a lot of books, a lot of books. And what he has done, and what I've realized over time is that, you know, the stuff. Or the, the context that appeals to the public from Fatawa Razawiya, for example, the wonders of fish in that book, you know, the ahadith that are mentioned in there, these are extracted from Fatawa Razawiya. Mm. If you look at laws of Salah, many rulings are extracted from Fatawa Razawiya. So if you just read the books of Amir al Sunnat, what you will find is that a lot of the context that if you were to read Fatawa Razawiya in you know English or Urdu, the things that appeal to you and are be beneficial for you will be found in Amir al-Sunnah's books. I mean, this is the amazing thing in this, in the last 40 years, from 1982, Amir al-Sunnah has kind of marched 
with the flag of Allah Hazrat essentially. And uh, you know, that, I remember some scholars saying a few years ago that if on the, at the moment on the surface of the earth, if you want to see somebody who truly devotes his life to the teachings of Allah Hazrat and follows in the way of the maslaki Allah Hazrat as they say, um, then it's truly Dawat Islami and Amir al Sunnah. What for Dawat is actually for for those of our viewers who don't know is basically it is a vast compilation of different everyday life situations. So you could walk in and say, what is the Shari ruling on this particular situation? And Allah Hadrat would give a very detailed answer in accordance with the Quran and the Hadith of Mubarakah, quote the ayats of the Quran that were relevant, quote the Hadith of Mubarakah, and then give a fiqhi ruling that uh, is binding essentially and saying this is it. And what that has done for the Ummah of Nabi Akram, especially in a door where we're away from books, is this exactly what you said, where Amir al Sunnah and other learned uh, Buzurgani deen and scholars can come along and say, well, we don't need to do that analysis now. We don't need to go to the main ayats of the Quran, we don't need to go to the main hadith of Mubarakah, because there's always a danger, no matter how uh, great a scholar you are, that you might get it wrong. What this genius upon genius has done is gone through all of that and set it out for you in such an easy way that you think of the situation and in the 30 volumes, is it? Yeah, 30 volumes 30 and it volumes. consists of two, uh, 21,656 pages and Roughly around about 6,847 question and answers. And oh, within wow. them, uh, the question and answers, they've been compiled into booklet form, and over 206 booklets have been written in that as well. Yeah, look at the age of Allah, for example, 30 years old, at his prime, uh, in his, you know, 30 years old, you, you're calling yourself, you know, you're at the prime of your age. And uh, Allah, he, he wrote 75 books, and then Within a span of 13 years, that was in 1887, and then up until 1909, at the up to the age of 43, this number of books that he's written increases to like 500 books. So, like if we look at just one particular book, just imagine how long it's taken. And when we talk about books like Fatawa Razviya, obviously this is a compilation that's been put together. But the works of Allah Hazrat, all these other departments that he's working in, but just books alone, he's got so many books in it. It's in a brilliant it. point because one thing that baffles me, and you know, I mean, I, all three of you can try and help me here. When you look at the life of the achievements of Allah Hazrat, you know, if somebody had written just Fatawa Razviya Sharif, nothing else. You would have probably admired him Hello. for centuries to come, saying, this person was amazing, he did this. If somebody had written just the Kanzul Iman translation, you would have said, this person is amazing because he's written Kanzul Iman. If somebody had single-handedly fought the Badakidgi that was there at the time, and the corrupt beliefs that were going around, and had raised the flag of the love of Nabi Akram, so you would have, that in itself, you would have said, this person is amazing. If somebody had just written Hadaike Bakshish, yeah, just that. You know, where you've got Nati Parks in four different languages, you've got all these complicated linguistic skills, all these, you know, amazing. And every Nath, the vision, you know, for the, for the reciter is perfect. Remember, there's one Nath where your lips don't touch. Where your lips don't touch. Oh, okay. All of these things, yeah. I mean, and then somebody just done that. You would have said, this guy's amazing. But for one personality, I mean, we've got to finish this section, but uh, I was reading something, and it truly, truly, really gets home, uh, you know, the academic intellectual ability of Allah Hazrat, but he wasn't just an academic, in every field he excelled. And what this was, was he said, um, he, ha he mastered the arts of the translation of the glorious Quran, Quranic tafsir, principles of tafsir, a recitation of the Quran with the Jweed, Hadith of Abarqa, the principles of Hadith, the encyclopedia of Hadith, jurisprudence, Islamic jurisprudence, theology, Islamology, dialects, syntax, linguistics, phonetics, Arabic prose, Persian language, uh, Urdu, Hindi, explanations, mysticism, ruhaniyat, you know, invocations, different, I mean, for example, Allah has to give you the orad and the zaif to do every day, these things, ethics, logic, philosophy, psychology, biology, sociology, economics, education, political science, commerce, banking, arithmetic, algebra, trigonometry, coordinate geometry, horoscopes, astronomy, all these, and it, the list just goes on, these were all things that Allah has written something on. And a lot of these sciences, even the people of today say, well, yeah, that's in accordance with the teachings of this particular, you know, things like zoology or botany in relation to plants and... I don't mind you know, uh, interrupting you there, there's a, actually a professor 
from uh, Kabul University in Afghanistan and he says that Allah Hazrat's work is worth presenting and he says we should preserve it and if there's so much historical and cult cultural information in there for India, Pakistan, Afghanistan and even Iran together that we should keep his works and his writings in our libraries so the institutions of the future can utilize Subhanallah. it. And we know that, that this is what the, uh, the intellectuals do because you can walk into Oxford and Cambridge and there are departments on the teachings of Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani, Sayyidi Ghose Azam, and their books. There are departments, even if you, if you search on the internet, um, Hazrat uh, Muhyiddin ibn Arbir, rahmatullahi, his books and his great fatawas, and there are tr translations of that carried out in their departments in universities dedicated to translating their books and this even, is even Imam Ghazali uh, as well Imam Ghazali sure. as well and this is perhaps what the bitter irony is that um, you know as Muslims we have forgotten our roots and our great scholars and their great teachings we're too busy with our you know Facebook accounts and everything else and the, the uh, people who don't believe uh, or don't have, you know the uh, non-believers are taking these opening departments and studying these texts and being mesmerized by them I, I, I recently read an article uh, by a university student who wasn't a Muslim but he was uh, singing such great praises of Hazrat uh, Muhyiddin ibn Arbi rahmatullahi he was saying this guy is something special because the way he explains things matters of you know spirituality I've never seen anybody else do it and I was thinking yeah and Muslims who don't even know you know this, this great treasure was left by this great wali of Allah for us and we don't know it I'm going to have to move on we, we, we want to move, keep with Allah Hazrat but um, kind of move in a different way Allah Hazrat the, the last thing I'd say Shiraz Bay Habib Shiraz Bay is this that if ever in your life you are unsure about an issue you're unsure about a matter of aqidah about beliefs you're unsure about a sherry ruling and you've got, you're not sure, maybe some people are saying one thing, some are saying the other, and you're not sure which way to go. There is a very simple solution. Just find out what, what Allah Hazrat Imam Ahmad Raza Khan Rahman says, find out what Allah Hazrat Zakida is, and you stick to that, you cannot go wrong. And the formula is as simple as that. And this is what Dawat Islami is all about. Dawat Islami says, look, we're not here to do anything. We are here to find the way of the Sahabai Kram and what Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi taught. And if we want to find that, the easiest and simplest way at the moment is follow in the footsteps of Imam Ahmad Raza Khan Rahman. You can't go wrong, can you? <laughs> now tell me this, my next question. What did Allah Hazrat say about the signs of Qiyamah, the lead up to Qiyamah, the uh, day of judgment? Uh, Habibai? Um, in Mulfu Sharif, which is the sayings uh, compiled by the students of Imam Ahmad Raza Khan, in the, it's mentioned a few points uh, in regards to uh, the day of Qiyamah. And first of all, Al Hazrat he uh, explains that there are three types of Qiyamah. The first type is called Qiyamah al Sughra, which means the small Qiyamah, the small um, end. And this is when a person dies, death. And so this is classified as a small Qiyamah. So whenever someone dies, uh, then indeed Qiyamah begins. So this was uh, mentioned in uh, Malfu Sharif. And the second type is uh, when a generation will die and a new set of people are born to replace that generation. That is the second type of Qiyamah. Is and that the, things like when the different qoms were destroyed, the Tufan of Hazrat Nu al Islam, yeah. Qom Iyad, Qom Samud, the so they would, when, the, when the generation was replaced, that was a classified as second Qiyamah, which is called Qiyamah al Busta, the middle one. And Qiyamah al Kubra, the biggest Qiyamah, is, uh, or you can say the final Qiyamah, is when the skies and the earth and everything that was between it will be destroyed, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will uh, destroy everything and re rebirth and give life back again. Uh, and when the day uh, of reckoning will then be established. So that is the third type of Qiyamah. Allah. So this has been mentioned in Al Malfu Sharif and many other points. Even Imam Ahmad Raza Khan, he was a uh, knowledgeable in the in the knowledge of Ilmul Jafar um, and Ilmul Jafar and uh, Ilmul Adad it uh, is a knowledge to do with 
uh, numerology basically mm. and uh, looking at uh, the numbers and what uh, the letters and the numerical values of them. Is that like you know when we write seven eight six? Seven eight and six. Basically, if uh, Alif was one, Ba yeah. was two, Tha was three. That, that, that type then of thing. Then you yeah. write Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, and then you get the numerical value of the of the bar letters, and the yeah. scene and everything else. And then when you get all the numbers underneath the letters, you add them all up and they come to um, seven eight six. I tell you something amazing about that. You know, Al Azraat Risala, every single title of his books. You know the name that is wrote for them. If you calculate them with Ilmul Abjad numerology, that title will uh, denote the, the date that he wrote that book. Allah, Allah, Allah. So every single name that he's given to the book is the date he actually wrote the book. So basically, he's gone back, thought of words, and then but thought of it in such a, an amazing intellectual way. It's like a secret code. And so if you if you got all the names, so the result could be called anything. But it adds up to the date he the published date, it. Yeah, which Can you is imagine amazing. The, I Just mean, the intellectual ability. I mean, look, a, a lot of the uh, things that we have, you know, uh, that we understand in our intellect processes comes from our five senses, doesn't it? And the five senses are limited. This is why they say that um, people who think that their intellect is amazing and it's unlimited are foolish because you can't have unlimited intellect, it's restricted by your senses. But then that doesn't apply to the valis of Allah, does it? Because they're not restricted to their senses, are they? So I suppose with uh, Allah Hazrat, um, you know, you've got there can be no doubt that um, they Allah Hazrat was a, a great vali of Allah, and so they have the sixth sense, don't mm. they? Which is the blessings of Allah, it's Allah still made of mm. Mm. granted knowledge. Now, Harun, by doing that for one risala, two risali. You know, for me and you, it's possible. Me, me and you could possibly do that if we do Arabic. Yeah. Risala basically means booklet, by the way. And doing that for 200 plus and getting them 100% right. And he's even done this for the date of his passing, the day he, he you know, from the ayat of the Quran, he's done you know, the day I'll pass away. And then from, he's took all the meanings from the Quran, the day he was born. It's amazing what he's done, just with numerology, which is one science. That cr goes past our brain. You talked about uh, Hazrat Ibn Muhyiddin Ibn Arbi, and his role, uh, like a story or some sort of like a rhyme, and um, it's pretty long, and it's amazing. It's like when Seen goes into Sheen, this will happen. When Dad goes into Saad, this will happen. And no one knew what this means. And Allah Hazrat Inm al Fushrif, he's gives you like insights of this, and he's saying back again to numerology. He's give you the full in depth. No one knew, knew what this means until Allah has hidden it's and secret knowledge. Secret, secret knowledge is secret. You just you know, give amazing. So basically, the, the question we were look, going towards was what Allah Hazrat said in relation to um, the signs of Qiyamah and that. And I've just been reminded that obviously when we moved on to Allah Hazrat and the signs of Qiyamah, um, there was a little caption that they were supposed to play and I forgot. So now that I've got a second chance, Salu al Habib sallallahu ta'ala ala Muhammad sallallahu Remember the hereafter and you will remember why you are here. Remember the hereafter and you will remember why you are here and what you are after and what you are after. So, um, and alhamdulillah, we've done a quick review of where we were up to. We've talked about the great personality of Allah Hazrat. But one of the main things we wanted to discuss today was what Allah Hazrat has written about um, the signs and the uh, Qiyamah. And Habiba, you were telling us about numerology. Carry on. Yeah, so uh, in uh, the compilation of the sayings of uh, Imam Ahmad Raza, uh, which is known as Malfu Sharif. Uh, so in there, he's mentioned some of the predictions that different scholars uh, have predicted regarding the date of Qiyamah. Uh, Imam uh, Qastalani, um, Rahimahumullah, who was a very famous scholar, died in 923 Hijri. He mentioned regarding uh, Imam Jalaluddin al Suyuti, Rahimahullah, where he says and quotes that uh, this Ummah will not exceed beyond a thousand Hijri. So that was his prediction. And uh, a few other scholars of Islam 
uh, have given their own predictions as well in regards to day of Qiyamah and when it will be. Imam Ahmad Raza Khan, rahmatullah ta'ala alayhi, uh, he also gave uh, some kind of predictions as well in which he um, mentioned that the rule of Islamic uh, on, on the world will, uh, will not be more, no more than 1800 and, uh, 1800th uh, Hijri. And in the 19th Hijri, Imam Ahmad, uh, Imam uh, Al Mahdi, he will appear in the world, and that is uh, it's about the 500 prediction. years from now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, Imam these Ahmad are predictions. Zahran. Now, you have to remember one thing, Rum by though. Remember, Judgment Day. First of all, it will come suddenly. That's a promise, or that's a hundred percent thing that's mentioned in the Quran that the Judgment Day will come suddenly you won't realize, you won't expect it and it's going to come so unexpectedly that's one thing, number two is so before Judgment Day so suppose you know after Isa Islam well, we'll get to in the future topics but when the sun goes the opposite direction you know these signs like the Dajjal and Imam Mahdi and Isa Islam will happen before the sun goes the opposite way because after that, remember, there's going to be a period of time where slowly the people will start to become non-Muslims again so this wa Imam Ahmad Raza Khan and he has you know, established his reasoning from a hadith and previous predecessors uh, what he has mentioned is that you know, this is the evidence, this is what has been mentioned and this is the day which you know, because of the hadith, this denotes that this will happen around this time. Okay, around this time. The actual knowledge of the judgment day is, you know, it's, it's a hidden knowledge, it's one of the secrets. Um, but as a Muslim, as you know, uh, me and you, Arumbai, we know look, the, the judgment day will happen on Friday, 10th of Muharram, uh, around Zor time. Okay, the hadith Sharif mentions that it would feel as if, you know, the time between Zor and Asr. So that gives you the insight that it's around Zohar time, um, which obviously depends on where you are in the world as well. So the actual Judgment Day itself, we know the exact day, date, month. The only thing we don't know is the year. year. And now that is actually, you know, knowing the day is going to happen, the time is going to happen, is more specific than knowing the year is going to happen. So the so that means that. You know, the information that we have got about Friday 10th of Muharram from the Prophet that means he's kept this hidden purposely so that we do, so then the test, you know, if you knew when Judgment Day is, the test is not really a test because you are anticipating it. So this knowledge has been one of the hikmahs behind it being hidden is so that we, you know, and it's sudden so that we are always fearful. You know, we are always fearful that, you know, any time Judgment Day could happen, we need to rectify ourselves before that time. Uh, saying that as well, there are signs that we can look at, uh, as mentioned in the hadith. The, the, the major, the the major, the major signs, signs, the minor Kiyama, signs. The major signs. So these are all, yeah. One of the things I was going to say, there was attaching ourselves with such personality. Like in this time, we've got Shikhi Tariqat Amir al Sunnah, we've got this Mughal of Dawud Islami, which encourages us to learn about you know about beautiful deen of Islam and encourages us to uh, learn the Farz Ulum and apart from that uh, things that will prepare our future generations for these sort of times that are going to come so today we need to look at ourselves as well that you know how practicing am I you know do I offer my namaz regularly because when we look at the signs of Qiyamah you know we've talked about them that a person you know the the knowledge will disappear the ulama will start disappearing uh, the works will start you know people won't be practicing etc so are we encouraging these times now mm. and we need to move away from that sort of environment i mean looking back at it now and standing back and kind of looking at it all the whole point and the purpose of these amazing teachings and people like allah has doing all these calculations for us is to say well don't get lost in this world because it's only temporary isn't that the essence of it that this is a temporary world these are the minor signs of the day of judgment these are the major signs and then there's this day that's worth 50,000 years in itself and there's eternal life in Jannah and Jahannam Arubai, and once again you know Surah Kahf I always mention that mm -hmm. this is very specific to our time I think was it yourself who mentioned the first ten I'm yeah. about protection from the so job now one of the things in what you learn in Surah Kahf is and it's amazing, you know, if you study this surat properly, it will actually, we should do a separate series just on that, to be honest. Uh, surat al-Kahf, what it does, it tells us the Ashab al-Kahf, they slept inside a cave, okay, in Jordan. 
and they slept inside this cave and a few people you know in the past uh, they said okay they slept for this much years they slept for this much years or they slept for this much years and they asked each other how long did we sleep for was it this much days was it this much days and in the end they said one of them replied saying Allah knows how long you slept for now Allah kept them years hidden from us of how long they slept for and Harun by one of the biggest reasons that you know the scholars have mentioned that one of the main reasons why Allah kept the years hidden from us of how long they slept for is because that's not the point of the story and the point of the story is that these youngsters they migrated from a place to save their iman okay and when they after saving their iman that's one moral of the story second moral is that after sleeping there was a resurrection they woke up Allah didn't tell us how long they slept for because we, that's not the real reason of the story mm -hmm. the main purpose that is for you as a reader is that these people are going to get back up as well and same for us we are living in the dunya okay we know there's a judgment day when it is we should be concerned what have we prepared and it goes back to the hadith of Hazrat Jabir where he asked Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when is the day of judgment and he says what have you prepared this is the answer we should like you know be asking ourselves what how we prepared for that day rather than you know when is it when is it and yeah uh, i mean a lot of youngsters these days that's a beautiful point uh, Shahad, where you make because a lot of youngsters especially you know middle-aged people as well they get lost in the world and those who are not lost in the world get lost in these topics of you know okay the, the signs of Qiyamah, the minor signs the major signs and all that they're fascinating they're amazing it's good to learn about that but then what they miss is that the most for them as you described everybody Qiyamah is when you die for you that is the end of it you're not going to see all these great events take place so you need to prepare for that Qiyamah Suhra and I suppose Qiyamah Kubra and the in-between is something that will happen on the surface of the earth but most of us will be underneath it so although it's fascinating information practically it's not of use to me for me is preparing for that Qiyamah Sugra and making the preparation so that on the day of Qiyamah Kubra I've got something to present in the court of Allah Rubai, look you know because if when you step back uh, like literally stepping back you know we for example we okay we've done you know, cover topics like Imam Mahdi, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, the Jal, Ya'juz, Ma'juz, Dabatul, all these different, they are fascinating, interesting topics. Oh, yeah, yeah. But stepping back, the reality is that we're going to die and be resurrected. That's the reality. Well, well, I mean, it could happen any time, but the reality yeah. is we probably going to miss all that. And, uh, you know, at least a lot of the scholars predict that 500,000 years and other, you know. So we're going to miss all of that. It's fascinating information for us. Viewers of Madni Channel, um, amazing topics today. What we've done is a summary. But today we've talked about somebody who was truly a genius. And the reason he was a genius was he taught us how to live our lives to prepare for that Qiyamah Sugra. Qiyamah Sugra basically is a small Qiyamah and that will be when we die, when our spirit leaves our body. Now, whatever good deeds we've done on the world, that's what we take with us. Our money, our bank balances, our children, our houses, our properties, our fast cars, our chilling out will all stay here. And that will be the start of our journey towards the end. Now, or towards the beginning if you're a good soul. And now, it's important to recognize that um, we can change our lives. We can change our lives, we can protect our Akkad, and we can live a fruitful life. This Hasti that we talked about today, Imam Ahmad Zahan Rahman, single handedly changed the face of the surface of the earth. You travel throughout the Muslim lands. And even in Arab countries, when you mention his name, his teachings, his books, and everything else are there. He single-handedly set up a beautiful system for us. Your Dawah Islami, you see this Madni channel every day. Most of what is taught on Madni channel, more of what is taught within the environment of Dawah Islami, is from the teachings of Imam Ahmad Razahan al-Rahman. Why? Simply because he was a genius who put before us the beautiful Islam that Nabi Akrim sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi brought for us. And he presented it in such a way that even people like us could easily understand and follow it. Why? Because it's not just about understanding it. A lot of people are knowledgeable. 
They have the knowledge. When it comes to time for Salah, they walk the other way. That isn't knowledge, that is ignorance. Knowledge comes together with action. If you have knowledge and you start acting upon it, protect your Salah, read the Quran, change the condition of your heart, humble yourself in the court of Allah then Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, you are preparing for the Qiyamati Suhra and the Qiyamati Kubra. And the minor signs or the major signs of Qiyamat won't matter to you. Fascinating to understand, yes, but those are the most important things. May Allah Jal give us all the ability to prepare. And may Allah Jal on the day of judgment, keep us with the pious saints of Allah Jal and uh, with people like the great Allah Hazrat Imam Ahmad Raza Khan I have to move on. I've got a fascinating second subject in the social issue section. Salu ala al-Habib sallallahu ta'ala ala Muhammad sallallahu Remember the hereafter And you will remember why you are here Remember the hereafter And you will remember why you are here And what you are after And what you are after We've got a very interesting social issue today and it's a topic which a lot of people suffer from. Now, let me give you an example. There, a, there is a king like no other king and there was a servant, perhaps like no other servant. And this servant of the amazing king is, um, you know, serves the king in such a manner that it can't be matched and yet this servant had within his heart this disease that we're going to talk about today and it ruined him the king of kings that is beyond our comprehension is Allah Zawajal. this servant was Iblis Azaziz he is reported to have worshipped Allah Zawajal on every inch of the earth. He spent years, he, was, he became so learned that he was teaching the angels at one point. And when Hazrat Adam salam was created, Allah Zawajal ordered the angels and Iblis to prostrate to Hazrat Adam salam. This was out of respect. And what did he say? He said, I'm better than him. You've created me from fire, you've created him from clay. Fire goes to up, clay is from the very... I'm, I'm most superior. Why should I go straight to him? Ya Allah, I worship you. I know that it's respect. The, the Sajda was Tazimi. It was out of respect, but he refused to do it. He refused to obey the command of Allah Azza And he developed a disease in his heart, thinking, I'm better call it the it syndrome. He thought he was it. And the result was that Allah banished him from Jannah and cursed him for his existence and then gave him respite till the day that was appointed. Um, so this it syndrome. Now the first question really I've got for the scholars is this. The, the sajda that Allah ordered Iblis and the angels to do was out of respect but it was a test as well to separate the milk from the water, as they say. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. So, yeah, like uh, Rumba, you've mentioned, this sajda was exactly like you said. You know, Allah declared this sajda, sajda of ta'zimi uh, out of respect of Allah's like creating something um, f from you know from the ayats from His own. Uh, you know, the ayat actually says from His own hands. Um, so this is like extra speciality put into you know his creation, uh, and now when he's asked or when he's commanded uh, the angels plus Iblis, whose name back then was Izazil, to you know prostrate to uh, this body, uh, which you mentioned right in the first episode of the Nur of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi was uh, placed on his forehead. So this is a sajda of respect to. Although physically the body of Hazrat Adam and that was, a, I think you mentioned in one of the first programs, that was a big
big body as well. It wasn't like normal, it was an amazing size as well. But the real res mark of respect and ta'zim was to the nur of the Prophet وسلم, which was found in the forehead of Hazrat Adam Ali Sallam. That was placed on his forehead and uh, he refused and was even more like, you know, uh, how the, the way or the attributes of Iblis were is that, you know, when he began this sort of discussion uh, with uh, Allah and he said, that, you know, man, not nakhre, but, you know, being a bit, uh, uh, like giving excuses, that why should I worship him? You know, in, in, in the ayat, is mentioned, khalaqta ni min that you created me from fire, and khalaqta hu min teen, and you created him from soil, mud, clay. Um, now, if you look at this ayat alone, you know what he's doing here, Iblis? He said, he's referred to himself first in the ayat as well. Allah, Allah, Allah. He's talked about himself first in the ayat. This is how much arrogant he was. That he, even in the ayat, he didn't say, look, you made him from mud, you made me from... No. He said, look, you made me from fire. And he's mentioned himself first. Uh, this was his arrogance and his level of arrogance. And the Quranic ayat, everything is significant from it. And for him to mention himself first before Adam Islam showed that this per, this this quality of his is or this attribute that he had um, this is the thing that got him expelled from the skies from his he became position. proud and arrogant and cocky and thought that he was something special I mean you, you mentioned the I am Barka in relation to uh, mentioning him first that he says I was created from fire there was something else that uh, I, I was uh, reading about or listening to in a and it said that um, when he said to, in the court about this is how low he had got you know he had lost his mind in this arrogance and pride what he said to Allah was can you give me respite till the day that you raise them up that's what the ayat of the Quran says. And what Allah replied was that I give you respite till an appointed time. What the scholars write is this, that he had lost his mind so much that he was trying to be clever with Allah He was so proud of himself, thinking I am clever, that actually what he was trying to do is this. We know that there will come a time after the day of Qiyamah when everybody will be raised up. Yeah? So everybody will die when the horn is blown. Then everybody will be raised up. Once everybody's raised up, there's no more death, is there? The death will be brought in the uh, uh, shape of a ram and it will be slaughtered. There's no more death. So what he said is, give me respite until the day you raise them up. Why? Because he wanted to avoid death. So that's why he did that, the scholars write, that even then, Nauzubillah he was trying to be clever with Allah and say, oh, give me respite till the day you raise them up, thinking, I will not taste death. And Allah, I mean, astaghfirullah al wa tuba I mean, how can you be trying to be clever with Allah? Azawajal? He did. This is how, how he'd lost his mind. But where did he lose it? He thought he was all knowledgeable. He thought he was proud. He thought he was it. And the reason we, we kind of chose this topic when we had our Madni Mishra earlier as well was, isn't this a problem that we've got a lot today? I mean, you're walking down the street, kids are playing outside, and you, you stand and you look at a seven-year-old. And he says, what are you looking at? <laughs> you know, and it, it, it's it. You know, and our youngsters, you know, when they, funnily enough, when they go for Juma, it's Friday, yeah? They go for Juma, they can't be bothered having a shower. Ooh, a brown and couple of straight out, you know, they've got the old clothes on and they're straight out, Juma, Tiga. And then come Friday night, going out with the boys now, he spends 15 minutes in the shower, 20 minutes in front of the mirror thinking, ah, oh, I look all right, I look cool, you know what I mean? And he thinks, you know, and he doesn't spend that much time preparing himself for Jummah and appearing in the court of Allah Azawajal. But this Saturday night, you know, nothing can get in his way. And he looks in the mirror and thinks, yeah, yeah, yeah. Isn't that just loving yourself? Pride, it syndrome, you know, you flash your new mobile about the boys say, Oh, you got a new mobile? Oh, yeah, you know me, man. I've got the latest mobile, you know. I've got the latest car. I got the... And this, isn't this all things that, I mean, what was bad with it? Tell me that for sure. So, this, um, so that, that attribute of basically, you know, uh, showing off, that's what it is, isn't it? You know, the one thing. Pride, arrogance, showing one, off. The first thing you mentioned is uh, where the person's being cocky. You know, you're walking in the street, you're like, you know. They walk like 10 men, don't they? Uh, that, that's, that's like arrogance, you know, like I'm something more than I actually am. Um, 
And then the second thing you mentioned is actually like showing off all the is the roots is istighbar, i.e. to do the kabur arrogance. Uh, even like for example racism, okay, is a separate term. Uh, even that the roots is arrogance. Uh, you know, finding someone higher in caste or color or whatever it is, this is arrogance, isn't it? Mm. Um, so all of these different names, cockiness being, you know, uh, just uh, you know showing off, and then uh, uh, for example racism. All of this, the root is uh, takabur, arrogance. Um, so that you know the the youngsters that actually you know they uh, specifically. Uh, want to go around and you know they, they I mean these guys uh, they probably work in uh, and, and there's no disrespect uh, halal rizq is halal rizq okay but they're working in a common job okay which is nothing wrong with it but then they are wearing such clothes which is out of the league they're not living within the means of yeah they? yeah I wanted and, to kind of hit it in the opposite direction as well uh, like in order to improve our character, what do we do? Is you know we we'll be listening now, Shaitan's characters and uh, how you know this arrogance is, is going through society, and we can see it prevail. You know even within our own homes, if we look around us carefully. So how do we get rid of it? Because this is something that's inside. It's a botany illness. You know, like if it's something on the outside that you could just wash it off. You know, uh, it's a it's a different matter, but it's inside and. It, it could have been something that's been embedded in you from a very, very young age. Like Shaitan, you know, it was something that was within him for a very, very long time. But uh, it came to a head when he was tested in front of Allah So I just want you to mention uh, an ayat Mubarak of the Holy Quran in Surah Al-Ahzab, Ayat 21, where Allah states, Indeed, for you, following the Messenger of Allah is best. SubhanAllah. Yani, if we want to improve our character and the manners, in order to enlighten our hearts, then we have to follow the impeccable manners and uh, you know the um, the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I mean, so many people came to Nabi Kareem sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam and misbehaved, talked in the wrong way. Now, if somebody has that power, that authority, I mean, the Sahaba Ikram, how often do we read in the uh, Hadith of Mubarakah, Sahaba Ikram, Hazrat Umar Farooq, Unshi, Thizor, saying, I'm going to take his head off. And Nabi Akram said, no, no, I'm going to teach him. And, uh, you know, that level of, you know, um, humbleness and that level of mercy and that level of compassion was unheard of. But at the same time, even, look, you know, that in the Madani recharge, few weeks ago, the story where the Prophet Sallallahu where that lady was about to leave town and the Prophet Sallallahu held her luggage and helped her. And you know, if it was someone like, you know, you know, the boss of a company, let's say, he'd never hold someone's bags. He'd never help someone. This is the Prophet of mankind. He has status, he has authority. He, you know, he's a high ranked, you know, in, in Allah's court. And he is holding the You know, when the, the Prophet ﷺ, um, would pray at night time as well, uh, his blessed wives would say to him that, you know, you're the Prophet of Allah. And he would reply, that not Allah, a, Allah, a, Allah. a servant of Allah that is, that is grateful for Allah. So even his humble, humbleness can be seen uh, when doing his ibadah. That the Prophet ﷺ is the best of mankind, the closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and still he is praising Allah, worshipping Allah, spending countless of nights worshipping and so much so that his blessed feet would swell up due to excessive standing. I mean, uh, what the glorious Quran tells us is that, you know, when you get arrogant and proud, think of who you are and what you came from. You know, you came from a, 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 a filthy drop, you came from nothing, and Allah Jal created you. And, you know, these days, what happens is, uh, we, we kind of Allah blesses us with a nice house, children, a nice car, we've got a good job. You know, Alhamdulillah, Allah has given us a, a good body, we're healthy. So now we get so proud that I become arrogant and I become, you know, I'm something, you know. And to the extent, now as we love it, you know, I, when it comes to doing the work, say, br doing the brush outside the masjid, yeah, mm. people, no, why should I? You know, and there was one incident in a, st in a mosque in the Midlands where um, one of the Namazi refused to, the Imam Sahib didn't come and um, 
one of the other namazis stepped forward onto the masala to read the salah and somebody said, no, I'm not reading namaz behind him. And said, why? Because he cleans the mosque toilets. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he was as humble as everything. He might have been, you know, some sort of committee member, but he was humble. And then this guy, and I think they went to one of the bazurgs and they said, uh, you know, this is what's happened. Should you be reading namaz behind the person who cleans the toilets? And the bazurg, rahmatullah was a very pious man. He said, I don't know about you, but find him. I want to read namaz behind him. Because mm-hmm. if he's cleaning the toilets of the house of Allah, then I, I, my namaz will be accepted behind him. And it all comes back to arrogance and pride. A lot of youngsters these days, they live in this bubble and the one thing that I, 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 was, I was really kind of almost hits me is this look let's strip it back and be real if our parents didn't come from um, Pakistan Kashmir and they didn't come and set up here so my, my granddad my Allah Zajal went to a high place in Jannah they passed away a few months ago and they hadn't come they came in 1963 and then eventually my Qibla Walid came in 1970 and then we, we came in 75 um, but if they didn't, we would have been in Pakistan, right? We wouldn't have had this luxury lifestyle and the big jobs and m- maybe if Allah had blessed us there, we would have had some sort of education, but the chances are a lot of people in our, in our neck of the woods didn't, so we probably wouldn't have had the education, so I, you know, I wouldn't have been sat here today. So if I sit here today and say, well, I'm a, I, I've got a good job, I'm a barrister, and I am look, I'm a Mudni channel and everything else, and I should be something special, and I stand like this, isn't it forgetting who I was yet? Yeah? I was nobody. I was nothing. I could be. I could be. You know, plowing the fields in my village right now, and not know where my next meal is coming from. And why do we forget? A lot of our youngsters, when they roam these streets, don't they, don't they realize who they are and where they've come from? She asked me. So, yeah, you know, uh, what the, one of the big reasons this happens is because of society itself, and everyone else is doing the same thing. So it adds on. Okay. You know, you, for example, today if we uh, delete our memory, then there's no more arrogance left, there's no more showing off left. But what happens is society automatically starts to add it on. Society starts to, you know, develop. And we talked about this uh, a few weeks ago. You know, like you get the iPhone. Yeah, Back then it was like just 16 gigabyte, 32 gigabyte, you know, that kind of sequence. Um, and you would ask your friend, okay, how much gigabyte is yours? Uh, what liter is your car and you just compete this whole life is, is, is like a competition you're racing against each other so going back to what Harumbai mentions regarding uh, the you know these youngsters on the streets uh, you know our reality where the Quran actually tells us that look you guys came from water okay uh, mud which we, we walk on you know, like the Hadith Sharif Harumbai is mentioned, you know, we cannot use uh, ha- uh, golden spoons or golden utensils. Okay, we're not allowed to use uh, silver utensils. These are specific for Jannat. Okay, we must, you know, Sunnat is the clay, clay utensils, because this is natural and it's from the ground and it keeps you humble. You know, we done uh, an experiment in um, uh, our course in uh, college. And what this experiment was is that you blindfold someone Okay, the students were blindfolded, and uh, in, in, in this experiment, when the student was blindfolded, another student, you know what gold leaf is, don't you? So it was basically a golden spoon, basically, right? And they put plain rice on the spoon, and they would feed the student who was blindfolded. And then he'd basically make a comment, is it, you know, what do you rate it out of 10? Okay, the taste of it. So they're doing it with a golden one, a silver one, and a normal steel one. And what had happened was that the golden one got the highest marks overall. The silver one got the second highest marks from the fuller class of 15, 16. And then the third one got the lowest marks, which was a normal steel, stainless steel spoon. Now what we get from that is it's the same rice, but the root of it, the golden structure, the thing that you're using from it, give you a different taste, give you a different side effect. And this basically plays on your mind as well. And this was an amazing uh, experiment. Because yeah. when I come into Jamia, and we were studying the hadith regarding okay, gold and silver and then silk and Riyazu Salihin, and I'm like, wow, this is amazing because it's coming back to our you know, science experiments that we were doing. So now this basically, even you know the clothes that we wear, the you know things, the instruments that we used, cars that we drive, all this is an input to our anayat, anayat meaning yeah. myself, the, I... The environment 
you know, it deeply affects the person as well. So whatever sort of environment that you're in, if a person's character and manners were different, when they go into a different environment, uh, you know, it could change based on that environment. Like even just using something, the taste of it could change. So you could go from a good environment to a bad environment, and it's definitely going to have an impact on you. Roman, there's a beautiful, sorry, uh, cut you off. There's a beautiful quote that comes into mind: is that you think so highly of yourself when you walk around with filth inside your stomach. Allah, Allah. You know, just realizing that what is inside me should automatically bring yourself down. And one thing to understand here is that Islam does not discourage uh, that you uh, have self-love and uh, be confident and that you don't th uh, you know, have that confidence and you always Listen, feel low. Listen, the Barakah of Allah has blessed you, show that, show it, yeah. Yeah. but it, it, it's not about what you wear, it, it's about what that has. For example, I've got this jubba on here, yeah? and now if I put the jubba on thinking it's an Islamic dress and inshallah I'll look nice for the program, that's one thing. But if I put this on with the animal, I'm something special. It's the same jubba. Well, don't be overconfident. Be confident, but don't be overconfident. Well, what don't that be means is, for example, but we have you know blessed hair. We have like a beard. We have our hair on our head. Okay, comb your beard. Allah's blessed you with something. Comb your beard. Look after it. Same with your hair. Okay. Now you have a body. Look after your body. Allah's give you a blessing. Don't make yourself look like, you know. Don't give yourself a negative appearance. Make them Muslim, and even the scholars have mentioned that when you send your children to madrasa, send the most beautiful child to madrasa, because he will be the face of Islam. Rep so, make Allah. yourself representative, make yourself approachable, put nice perfume on. This is what it means by you know when you, Allah has blessed you, show His blessings to people. I.e., make yourself look pr uh, presentable. Mm -hmm. Rumba, you know the. I think we are getting to the end of the segment, but. On the spiritual side of things, our buzurgs in the past, they um, never ever, they found it, you know, our, the, uh, our mustahab things, our good, you know, what we call uh, good acts, they wouldn't do, they did, this was like, uh, you know, something forbidden for them, okay, and they, uh, you know, their mustahab acts were our, like, far as wajib, you know, our high rank, um, so these buzurgs, they found, they made it upon themselves uh, haram to say the word I. They would never use the word I because we're going back. That's, that's every second where we use exactly. me, I, I, me. iPhone. <laughs> Everything's got I. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> iPad and everything you know. else. But they basically made it haram upon themselves spiritually, not fake haram, but spiritually mm. haram. I'm not going to use the word I. And they would use other words, like they would sidetrack and say hum, okay, or we. They wouldn't use the word mm -hmm. I. <clears throat> so this is one thing, remove I out of your life, okay? See, uh, and we become focus the center. on Allah. The yeah, main thing is, is exactly what I was just gonna say. remove yourself, negate yourself, okay? Don't basically affirm yourself, negate yourself and affirm Allah Like, la ilaha illallah. Yeah? Get rid of everything else. Attribute yeah. your, your goodness that whatever is good that is mine is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah gave me the blessings to wear good clothes, then it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's nothing from my account. If Allah wanted, I could have been wearing ragged clothes. That's the way so we always pie. bring it back to that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that chose this for me and I should be grateful. Uh, grateful. So that, that was the way of our pious predecessors, wasn't it? Attribute everything that you good to Allah's blessings and attribute anything that's bad to your own sins. But what we do is anything that's good is me, my skills, my intellect, I've done this, and anything that's bad, it's your fault. Yes. It's your fault. You it. It. Be, you, if you didn't do that, that problem wouldn't have come to me. Mm. And how do we get rid of that now? We've got about five minutes left. Mm -hmm. What I want to do is practically leave examples, because we've got a lot of youngsters who are watching us. Alhamdulillah, we're getting some good uh, feedback, and we've got a lot of youngsters. I want you to give them some madni pearls of exactly how they can get rid of this it syndrome. You know, life at the moment, in the real world out there, evolves around me. I am it, whether it's my parents, parents don't matter. So long as I get what I, I mean, I was speaking to one parent and the son is earning, um, I think he was earning 1,200 pounds a month, yeah? And when they said to him, can we have some, you know, he lives at home and everything else. He said, I'm barely uh, making ends meet. He said, 
1,200 pounds a month, and you're, you're living under this roof, you're eating here, and you've had, he said, no, he says, my, my takeaway bill for the month is 500 quid, my bodybuilding milkshakes and all that, whatever they have, yeah, is about 400 quid, and then there's my own kharcha, and my insurance for my car, and my um, mortgage, uh, mor and he didn't have mortgage, dad's paid, you know, your poor father's running around and do that, but he's got a car, and uh, you know, and he said, my car's, uh, you know, Kishta, as they said, the, the installments on that. And so he goes, I'm barely making a living, I'm barely making ends meet here, and you should feel sorry for me. And it, all it is is it syndrome, isn't it? You know, parents have been through so much, and they, if they say, you know, we're struggling to pay the bills this week, can you help? Oh, no, no, you know what I mean? And it, why? Because I'm looking at me. I've not looked at the bigger picture. I've not looked at the poor father who's not, uh, you know, um, bought shoes for six years and he's got holes in his. I remember when I went to uh, bar school, it was very expensive. You didn't have uh, grants and all that, yeah? So Kibla Walisab actually had retired and went back to work to put me through bar school. And you know, every time I was at uni, uh, you know, may Allah uh, bless Amiji, they used to say, remember that. Your dad's mm. working a 12 hour shift to put you through bar school. And this is how difficult it was. And that brought you down a peg or two. You know what I mean? And so I, my question to you guys is what message have you got for the youngsters? A minute each, you know, to get rid of. And generally, everybody is, we all suffer from this. You know, the shaitan says to me, everything you do, you're amazing, you're brilliant, you're doing this, you're doing that. And suddenly, that intention which started off maybe pure for the sake of Allah or to help the parents, or help the brothers and sisters, becomes riyakari, becomes everything else. You know, the Buzurg Anideen, they've always warned us that one of the biggest dangers and traps of the shaitan we can fall into, which can completely destroy you from inside and out, is this arrogance and pride. How can we protect ourselves from this? My advice would be, uh, two points of advice I would have to give. Number one, thank people. Be grateful to people who gave you favours, that helped you in gaining your, your success, gaining whatever you have. And secondly, is always thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Attribute whatever good that you have inside you, if it's a materialistic thing, or if it's some inner skill, whatever you have, attribute that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That whatever I have, that is because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if Allah wanted, He can take that away from me at any time. And we see that you know many people who are wealthy, millionaires, they fall into uh, financial problems and become completely bankrupt. And we should always uh, thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whatever situation He's put us in, be grateful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me this opportunity and this success. Subhanallah. Um, I would say what you said is, uh, speak to your elders, your father, grandfather, and ask them how life was, where they come from. Allah, Allah. And just that itself, you know, if you ever do, the youngsters nowadays, they don't really sit with their parents, but please try to, and ask them, you know, how was life like back in the 50s and 60s? And, you know, they tell you, we used to push some rari down the bazaar and sell apples or something. Uh, we used to bend metal and, you know, all these crazy jobs, blacksmith. Just that alone, I'd say, is enough to knock some sense into a youngster for at least a few days. Uh, come as come, it will actually, you know, uh, help him understand where reality is and, you know, coming into uh, this, you know, type of community, uh, the, all the benefits that it gives you as well, and basically takes you away from the reality, reality when it gives you all these benefits. Talking to your fathers, your grandfathers, talking to the people that were struggling and came here, and, you know, for your future, okay, and now you're sat there in the Range Rover, in whatever it is, you know, with your chest out, music high, and you've forgotten your reality. Um, and then at the same time, you have to look at spiritual. The Prophet ﷺ, all the sacrifices he made, okay, the Sahaba Ikram, the sacrifices he, they made, even the Tabi'een, all the way up to now, all them sacrifices up to your parents that were put in just for you to be where you are today. Allah, Allah, Allah. So it's such a beautiful way of putting it. All the that treasure of Iman that everybody Look at Imam fought. Hussain, Imam Hussain for the Quran, he Allah, sacrificed Allah. himself. He gave his child, children away, he gave his full family away just for you to read the Quran. 1460 years, I, I love the way you said that. 1460 years of sacrifice, sacrifice just for what to you make are. sure you get Iman and today you sat there proud in this Range Rover thinking you're smoking your and even and on the, the day of judgment, even in the grave, on the day of judgment, all the way up until you get to the Jannat, 
Prophet Sallallahu will be helping you, guiding you. You know, we don't give that shukr and appreciation to them. For us, it's just me, myself, and I. And it should be Allah and His Rasul, the Messenger, Islam, Quran. Allah, Allah. MashaAllah, beautifully summed up there. Views of Madni Channel, arrogance leads us to sickness of the mind. It leads to incorrect behaviors. It leads to marital problems. It leads to family problems. Why? Because I'm arrogant. A lot of the time, I'm too arrogant to accept my mistakes. I can't make a mistake. I'm brilliant. I'm infallible, you know. And this is a deception of the shaitan. And one of the ways to get out of this is by reading the translation of the glorious Quran, reading books like the Sirih Sarat al Jinan Sharif, which you can download free from dawatislami.net. You've got a translation for Kanzul Iman. Um, you could have got uh, the uh, translation by Mufti Abdul Nabi Hamidi Sahib, uh, which is on dawatislami.net. Then the books of the Buzur Ganadin. We mentioned Sayyidi Ghosi Azam radiallahu ta'ala and Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani. Sayyidi Ghosi Azam radiallahu ta'ala has written a lot about getting rid of this pride and arrogance from inside ourselves. <laughs> has this Shaykh Mawyuddin ibn Arbi rahmatullahi spent Imam his Ghazali life? Sahab. Imam Ghazali. <laughs> I was just going to come to that because I was going to quote from Imam Ghazali. Um, Imam Ghazali was some considered the master of the diseases of the heart. And what he said is this. This is a Quranic chronic disease, man considers himself with the eye of self-glorification, self-importance, and considers others with contempt. And we look at ourselves, Allahu Akbar, Imam Ghazali just... And words got, are deep as well. He goes deep as well, but you know, sometimes you read this, you think, I think is he talking about me? And Allahu Akbar, he goes on, he says, the result as regards the tongue is that he says, I, I, as the cursed Iblis said, I am better than he. Thou has created me from fire, but you created him from clay. And then the self-exaltation, the self-advancement become his endeavors. He's basically, he wants to advance, but advance the I, the me. I want to be bigger. I want to be everything. I want everything. I want people to praise me. I want people to say he's brilliant. I'm doing everything. I'm praying Salah, but I'm, I'm holding my hands. I'm doing everything. Why? Because I want people. And that takes all his life. And the shaitan has got you exactly where he wants you because everything in your life is not as you very beautifully summed up for Allah and his Habib Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's for myself, my ego, my nerves. Dear Islamic brothers, viewers from Madni Channel, try and consider that. You know, contemplation for a moment is better than years in worship. There's a beautiful hadith of Barakah to that effect as well. Let's contemplate. And by reading the books of the Buzur Ghanideen, by reading the books of Allah Hazrat Imam Ahmad Razakhan Alayhi Rahmatul Rahman, what it does, it will put you in touch with reality. Because like the body has viruses, we know that there are pandemics, there are diseases of the heart. And you know the outward diseases, you get temperature, you get flu, maybe it might you know, have detrimental effects. But the inward diseases are the most dangerous because they can take away your Iman. May Allah give us all the ability to protect ourselves. Um, we've already got a four minutes left, so I'm going to quickly move on to our last segment. And our last segment is a very special one because in this one, we come back to reality. I like this section because it's, it's, a, it's almost a wake-up call and a reality call. And what we have is that, you know, um, the, uh, it encapsulates it in a beautiful couplet that somebody wrote. Uh, because having done everything, you can sum up everything in this one couplet. Ki Muhammad se wafatu ne to hum tere Ye jahan cheez hai ki Allah kalam tere Ke the love of Nabi Akrim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Loyalty to Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is everything in the world. You have the love of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the worlds are yours. I'm going to share with you a beautiful hadith in Barakah. Hazrat Huzaifa bin Yaman radiallahu ta'ala once uh, re requests his mother, Ke, Amiji, if you give me permission, I want to go to pray Maghrib behind the beloved Habib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this was the beautiful way of the Sahaba Ikram, that they couldn't bear to go home. <laughs> they used to, they wanted to just stay in the court of Nabi Ikram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And look at um, and the, the dear mother, she says, so request him to make dua for forgiveness for me and you. Hazrat Sayyidina Huzafa bin Yaman says that I went to the blessed court of the beloved Habib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with this in mind, Ki Akka Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I'll make a request, Ki Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, make dua for the forgiveness of me and my mother. 
So he prays Maghrib Salah, Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam leads the prayer. When it's completed, they stay in Zikr so he doesn't disturb the rest of creation. And then Isha comes and he's still got this in his mind. And Isha Namaz happens and then uh, Akka Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after Isha leaves. And Hazrat Huzaifa bin Yaman, not having found the opportunity to make this request, starts to follow Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Oh, now, the next part of the Hadith of Barakah, I'm going to quote verbatim because there's something beautiful in there. He says, this is his eyewitness account, he says, I followed him, as in Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The beloved Habib Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam heard my voice and said, Who? Is it Huzaifa? So, Akka Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is walking along, here's the footsteps. It's Hazrat Huzaifa bin Yaman, he's got this intention and he's walking behind. Akka Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam doesn't turn around, just says, Who is it, Huzaifa? So, this gives you the beautiful insight into the knowledge of Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Hazrat Huzaifa bin Yaman radiallahu ta'ala says, I humbly said, Yes, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And next question, Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, What do you need? So, the first question was, Who is it? And then Akka Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam answers it himself and says, Is it Huzaifa? Next question, what do you need? Then Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, May Allah Azza wa Jal forgive you and your mother. So he's not even had a chance to speak. He's not had a chance to speak. Now he's come from home with the intention of getting this dua. He's waited Maghrib, he's waited Isha. He walks behind the best of creation. Doesn't you know, tell Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, I'm here, I want this dua. No. Before he can open his mouth, Akka Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam fulfills whatever is in his heart, then Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, there is an angel here who has never descended to the earth before this night. He requested permission from the court of Allah Azzawajal to make salam to me and give me some good news. That news is that Hazrat Fatima Dahra radiallahu ta'ala anha is the leader of the women of paradise, women of Jannah. And that Hazrat Sayyidina Hassan and Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu are the leaders of the youth of Jannah. What an amazing hadith of Mubarak. I mean, first of all, it gives us the great love of the companions of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Their life evolved around uh, Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi Somebody asked Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, what is the most beloved thing to you in the world? And you know what answer Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala gave? He said the beautiful face of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What an answer. I mean, Allahu Akbar. You know, can there be anything more beautiful? Ashiki Akbar. Ashiki Akbar, Allahu Akbar. I mean, it's just, you know, there's so many things that, you know, he could have said. But he said, no, there's nothing more beautiful than the face of the beloved Habib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then this companion as well. It gives us an insight into the ilm ghaib of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the knowledge that Allah azza has blessed him with. And also the knowing that an ummati has come for a special du'a and has it in his heart and Akka Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam blesses him with that du'a now time isn't, doesn't restrict the powers that Allah gives his beloved Habib so today if we have that love of Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we ask, you know, after namaz we read through the salam we ask Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we ask for the sake of the beloved Habib Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that Allah Azzawajal blesses us there's no doubt we will be blessed today as well Dear Islamic brothers, uh, viewers of Madhi Channel, we've come to the end of our program today. We learned about a great Hasti, uh, Imam Ahmad Rizakhan Alayhi Rahmatu Rahman Allah Hazrat, and how brilliant and amazing he was. Then we learned about the signs of Qiyamah, and then a big disease of the heart, this it syndrome that we need to work on and get rid of. And the way to kind of encompass everything is this. You know, sometimes we want to change our lives and it's always difficult. Perfect one thing, your love for Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by reciting through the path and everything else will fall into place. Salu ala al-Habib sallallahu Remember the hereafter And you will remember why you are here Remember the hereafter And you will remember why you are here And what you are after, after.